the clock has struck one. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We are going to be talking all about wildlife rehabilitation with our guest scientist, Jess Anderson. So here's how this is going to work. Um, Jess is going to give us a bit of an introduction, um, and then you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Most of these sessions are all driven by your curiosity. So down at the bottom, you'll see that there is a Q&A function. Please submit any questions that you have via the Q&A. If you have other comments that you'd like to tell me, maybe what music you want to hear uh, next time before the session, or maybe uh, types of science that you would like to hear about, you can put that in the chat, but everything else, all questions for Jess, put it in the Q&A. Um, other than that, that's really all the housekeeping that we have. Um, as you may know, our Skype a Scientist program really functions completely off donations. So if you can support us on patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist, we would really super appreciate it. But with that, I will uh, stop talking and get into the science. So Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I just have a, a short little brief intro and then we can get started on questions. Great. All right, let me see if I can share my screen. Da, 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 da. Yes. Hmm. It is not letting me want to share. Let's see. And worse comes to worse, if we can't do it, I can just talk through our intro too. That's fine. Um, hmm. It says you're a co-host. Um, yeah, and it says it says that like it gives yeah. me the option. It shows up, but the share button is grayed out. Like it won't let me click. Oh, there it is. Hold on, I got it. Okay, We're great, all good. Great. Wonderful. Okay. All right. So here we go. You guys can see. All good. All good. Uh, awesome. So just a brief introduction about me real quick. Um, my official title here is the Rehabilitation Program Manager, but I am a licensed rehabilitator for the state of Virginia. Um, so my job uh, basically is to oversee the rehab journey of all the patients that we get in for care. So that's when they come in as they're you know, getting raised or getting treated for whatever injuries they have all the way up until release figuring out where to release them, when to release them, things like that. Um, but I do wear a couple of other hats where, you know, I also go out on rescues to grab animals if they need additional help. Um, I also am our coordinator for our volunteers and interns. So I do a lot of training um, and teaching that way. I also help train and present some of our ambassador animals that are non-releasable. We can kind of go into more of that if you guys have questions. And then I'm also part of our social media team. So a lot of different hats. Um, but I have been involved with rehabilitation specifically for the last eight years. A little bit about what I do. So I work out of a wildlife hospital called the Blue Ridge Wildlife Center located in Boyce, Virginia. We're a full service hospital. Um, we're on track this year to see over 3000 patients, which would be a huge record breaking number for us. We do have 24 animal ambassadors. So those are all animals that could not be released due to injuries or issues that they previously had. Um, I have worked at two other facilities other than Blue Ridge. I worked at a facility in Texas um, as well as a marine mammal focused facility in California. So I've worked with a whole bunch of different species anywhere from California sea lions to bald eagles to armadillos to timber rattlesnakes and you know, a whole bunch more. Um, and then just a little bit about wildlife rehab for anyone who's not familiar with it. Um, basically, our goal is to take an injured, orphaned, or ill wildlife with the goal of releasing them back to the wild. So we are not keeping them or handling them or doing anything with them to keep them as pets um, or against their best interest. We want to get them back where they came from so that they can live their best wildlife. Um, we do have a code of ethics that we hold ourselves to to make sure that you know we are doing things in the best interest of the animals. We also work with veterinary professionals, whether you work out of a facility or if you're a home rehabber, you have to have a vet that you work with. Um, and this is a really amazing growing field. Every year, more and more people are getting involved. Every year, more facilities are popping up. Um, so it's really interesting to see how rehab has kind of um, evolved over the last couple of years. Um, just to make sure people know it is illegal to rehabilitate wildlife without a permit. And that's because there is so much information that you need to know and so much training that goes into it. 
that if you try to do it yourself without having those regulations behind you, um, people tend to do more harm than they do good. And then as my lovely little meme, I love this meme, uh, a lot of people think that all I do as a rehabber is going out and rescuing animals and you know looking really cool and calm and collected when really the majority of what I do is cleaning cages. So <laughs> there's that. Um, and that's just, that's me. That's, that's who I am, what I do. Um, so we can get started with any questions. Awesome. Thank you. I think uh, a lot of cleaning is one of these things that is present in a lot of animal jobs. I think if you want to work with animals, uh, you better be good at cleaning. Like everything from fostering cats, like which I've been doing during the pandemic to uh, working with squid, working in an aquarium. It's a lot of cleaning. Okay, but let's get into our questions. Okay, so we've got a question from uh, Elise McCartney. What is the most dangerous animal you have ever helped to rescue and rehabilitate? Um, I guess danger is kind of what other people think about. So um, we did get a, a timber rattlesnake in this past December and he was super cool. I find snakes in general and especially venomous snakes really interesting um, and beautiful. So we do have proper protocols in place. We have proper PPE to handle them. Um, we use uh, you know snake tubes and, and hooks to try and keep ourselves safe. So while yes, they're dangerous, we kind of have those protocols in place to keep ourselves safe. Um, we also had a bobcat one time who was a, a head trauma victim. So he was very quiet. And whenever you have a wild animal that allows you to pick them up and like walk right up to them, something is wrong. <laughs> so this guy was able to walk up to this bobcat sitting in the road, called us, we went out and got him. We were like, oh gosh, like he looks pretty bad. And after about three or four days of supportive care, he started growling at us and started getting much more rowdy. And we said, all right, you are good to go. We are not gonna risk anything. Um, so he required a lot of veterinary care just to make sure you know, we could sedate him when handling him to keep us safe. So I, I would put those two as our, our top kind of most dangerous patients. Very cool. And you mentioned um, snake hooks and snake tubes. What are those? Um, so, there are methods and tools that we use to, instead of us physically grabbing a snake, especially a venomous snake, who, if we don't restrain appropriately, could turn around and bite us, even potentially through gloves that we're wearing. Um, so these are tools that help us keep them safe and properly restrain them and make it safe for both of us. So the snake tube is going to be a length of clear plastic tubing that we'll put at the front of the snake and basically encourage the snake to move forward into it. So we want to make sure that it's tight enough that the snake can move in, that they can't turn around and easily wriggle back out. Once they're in the tube, we can grab them and restrain them at the bottom of the tube to prevent them from going too far or coming back out before we're ready to handle them. And then a snake hook is just, again, it's basically a long stick with just this nice hook, and we can easily manipulate and pick up that snake without it being too close to us um, so hopefully they're not as stressed out, but also it can protect us in case they do get aggressive or, you know, in their case, defensive. Right. Totally. Very cool. All right. We've got a question from Stephanie Russell. What type of training or education do you need to be a rehabber and how long does all of that education take? Um, I get this question a lot because people always want to know, you know, should I go to college for rehab? And if I do go to college, uh, what kind of courses should I take? And rehabilitation, in my opinion, is something that, yes, college can be beneficial because it can give you some background info in terms of like natural history on certain animals, um, animal identification, and kind of like understanding some animal behavior. But in my opinion, I don't think that you have to go to college for wildlife rehabilitation. Um, a lot of things that we look for when we're looking to hire someone or, um, you know, we're considering someone for a position is mostly just experience. Um, I want to see, you know, have they experienced rehab before? What kind of experience? How long? What kind of animals have they worked with? Um, you know, what kind of environments have they worked around? Um, were they a home rehabber? Did they work with a team? Things like that. Um, so my recommendation is always if you have a facility close to you or you have a home rehabber near you, which you can normally find those people in a list 
on your state wildlife agency, call them, reach out to them, email them, see if you can volunteer and, you know, dip your toes in because you might have expectations of what this field is like. And that might be completely different from what the reality is. So I always recommend people try to volunteer, get involved somehow first before really pursuing something that may down the road be really financially, you know, <laughs> imposing on you. Um, and make sure that that's something that you're passionate about. Um, but overall, there are a lot of classes that you can take online. There are conferences. Um, the National Wildlife Rehabilitation Association is a, a big one who puts on a conference every year. Um, and the last year, and I think this upcoming year, they have been virtual. So they're a little bit more accessible for people. There's a lot of information, other courses that you can take online through either wildlife centers, um, like the Wildlife Center of Minnesota, I believe that they have a, a raptor course that you can take. Um, but there's a lot of stuff online that you can also access books, reading, just talking to, to your local rehabbers. Um, that would be my, my most important and priority in terms of, you know, starting that training and starting to learn about uh, how to go about that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have a, a couple questions that are all sort of related to one another. Um, one, th and, and that is, uh, do you track the animals after you release them? Do you chip them? Do you use something else to kind of keep tabs on how they do once they're out back in the wild? Um, so that's a really great question. And we personally don't, uh, mostly because in order to do something like that, it normally has to fall under some sort of research and that has to be federally or state approved. Um, so we can't mark animals or banned animals without specific permits. And in order to make get those permits, we have to submit proposals and go through all of that. Um, and overall, we generally don't have the people permitted, like bird banding is a whole other situation that requires specific permits that we as rehabbers do not have here. Even though we have the experience of handling birds, we don't have the experience of banding them. Um, so any bands that we use for our personal ID purposes here, we do remove those bands before we release them. Um, but as far as like tracking them, occasionally people will let us know, you know, especially for turtles where you can take a picture of their carapace and see those designs, you can track that turtle later by comparing it to photos of those designs and those markings. They all have their own individual makeups for that. Um, occasionally we do release some animals here on property that may have some physical attributes that we can tell like, oh, he had a, a, a partial ear, you know, part of his ear was missing or, you know, this part of his tail was missing and then we see them later. Um, but that's really the only follow up that we can reliably get. And even then it's, it's definitely uh, hard to for sure be 100% that that is in fact the animal that you released. Thanks for that. Um, what do you think the most common uh, rescue animal tends to be? So if we want to go off statistics, <laughs> which we have that. Um, so our top patient that we take in year round is the Eastern Cottontail. And that's also based on where we are, right? We're in Virginia. Um, Eastern Cottontails are native here. And we have a breeding season for them from basically starting in March all the way until you know, mid to late September. So we're still getting babies in right now. And we generally take up over 400 cottontails throughout the year. And that's babies, adults, juveniles, things like that. Um, generally speaking, coming up right behind them are Virginia possums. Um, but that's also too, when people find baby possums in need, they normally find a whole litter and you can have upwards of 13 babies in a single litter. So just one litter of 13 babies, you could get a few litters and you're already talking, you know, multiple, multiple possums from there. Um, after that, it's normally Eastern gray squirrels again. And these are all animals that are gonna be living in close proximity to humans, which makes them far more likely to be found, far more likely to um, have interactions with people that could lead them to needing help. Um, so we don't see as many of those very reclusive animals like Bobcats, we don't see them very often. Um, black bear, we don't see those. Um, we actually can't rehabilitate black bear, but we don't even really get calls for them that often. Um, and again, venomous snakes. You know, normally these venomous snakes are are staying away from people. They're staying in the woods, especially timber rattlesnakes. 
Um, so we don't get to see or you know have those uh, situations come up very often. Cool, thank you. Um, a lot of people have asked, what is the cutest animal you have ever rehabilitated? <sighs> um, oh, that's hard. Probably North American river otters. Oh, oh, they're, they literally are like little stuffed animals and they squeak <laughs> and you're just like, oh, oh my gosh. And so we actually don't have great facilities for otters because we, and again, we don't see them very often. So there's no real need for us to have that. We right. could raise them from babies, but then once they get bigger, we generally will transfer them. And every time we get them, we try to call around. We have a really great network of rehabbers in Virginia. We'll call around and say, hey, who, you know, anybody else have river otter babies that these guys can go with? Can we transport them down? And I'm always like, yes, they need to go mm -hmm. because they're too cute. I cannot. This is hard for me. <laughs> yes, it's, it's <laughs> very terrible. difficult. And I'm, I'm normally very good about like, okay, it's a wild animal, you know, stuff my emotions down. But like, you look at them and it's just soul melting. Ugh, it's, it's, it's hard for that. <laughs> that sounds, yeah, very, very <laughs> cute. Um, so about how many animals a year pass through your facility? Um, so here right now, we are up to 2,859 patients and it's wow. September. So um, generally speaking, we see about a 10 to 15 increase every year. So since 2016, since we moved into this building, I think we started at like 1,600 animals and now we're almost to 3,000. So it's, wow. it's definitely been something where we don't know if it's if more people are encountering animals or just more people know that there's somewhere where they can take them. Um, but we get, we're, we're still growing every year. So we're hoping to kind of grow that our facility as well. Very cool. Um, so how do you find out about these animals that need to be rescued? Do people bring them to you? Do you get a call? Like, how does this work? Um, for the most part, I'd say about 90% of our patients that come to us are just people out, you know, they're walking their dog or they walk out on their deck or they're out hiking or driving and they find an animal and they're like, this doesn't look right. I need to do something. And so by that time, either they're Googling and they're like, what do I do with a baby squirrel? Or they're on Facebook asking people. Um, and that's the great thing about, you know, making sure that people know that you're there because hopefully other people are telling them, oh, you should check out Blue Ridge Wildlife Center or, oh, check out the, the Department of Wildlife Resources page with rehabbers, like they need to get a rehabber. So 90% of our animals are coming from just, you know, normal, regular people who find an animal, are concerned, um, we do try to tell people to call us first because if you drive an hour from Ashburn or from Northern Virginia out to us and you have a fledgling robin that is perfectly healthy, uh, unfortunately, you're gonna be making that hour drive back home with that robin because if they can be reunited, if they can be um, you know, given back to their parents, those are always our number one options. But we're always here as a plan B in case it fails, in case mom doesn't come back, or in case the baby is injured, ill, or starts going downhill after reuniting. Thank you for answering that. Um, the next question, about how long does it take animals to get rehabilitated to go back out? So that's really species specific. Um, like for example, Eastern cottontails, they take only maybe five weeks before they are old enough to be out on their own. You know, that's from birth to, bye mom, I'm leaving, I'm moving out, I'm getting a job, we're all good. Um, so bunnies are very quick rehabilitation um, species. However, with that being said, then you could look at, um, again, river otters, they take over a year to rehabilitate because they stay with their parents for the winter and then the next spring they disperse. Um, American beavers can take two to three years to rehabilitate. So if you wow. get a brand new, for like just was born this year, baby beaver, congrats, you have a baby beaver for like the next two to three years. Um, so it, it really depends on the species and that's why we especially push, you know, if you find an animal, 
make sure you're getting that animal to a professional because they're going to know when that animal can be released, when they're appropriate to be released, where to release them, um, what time of year to release them. Um, so it, it can be really anywhere between that. I would say most commonly, most of our patients on average take anywhere between one and a half to three months to make, you know, go through the whole process. Awesome. Uh, beavers are one of my favorite animals. They're so cute. I could just, <laughs> if I had a beaver in my house, that would be great. I'm sure they would make an absolute mess, but that's great. So what animals do you have as ambassador animals? Um, so we have two dozen ambassadors and that kind of ranges uh, overall. So if I go through, let's go through the list. We've got three Eastern box turtles, two wood turtles, a diamondback terrapin. We have a big brown bat, an Eastern rat snake, two Southern flying squirrels, two Eastern screech owls, a red phase and a gray phase. And then we have two red tailed hawks, two Virginia possums, oh. a peregrine falcon, an American kestrel, uh, a bald eagle, a skunk, a striped skunk, and an Arctic fox. And I think, I think that's it. I think that's How'd you end up with an Arctic fox? She was confiscated. Um, yeah. <laughs> <it sounds laughs> just like. Like, so um, similar story, our, our striped skunk came to us in the same way. So um, she was actually bought as a pet from a flea market in Pennsylvania. Oh, my and God. then the the homeowners lived in Virginia and were like, "Yes, yeah, so cute. We're gonna bring them home." But they didn't realize that it's actually illegal in Virginia to have wildlife as pets, even if they were technically uh, domestically or captive bred. Right. So that includes foxes, that includes skunks, which in other states you technically can buy them. Like there are breeders for them, uh -huh. um, but they tend to have, you know, health issues. They can't ever be released. And then obviously if you move them from state to state, there are different regulations. So they were not allowed to have her. Um, she was only six months old and the police called us and they said, you guys take care of foxes, right? And we were like, yes, why are you being sus about this? And they were like, <laughs> Uh, we'll we'll show up. It will be there in a little bit. And then they showed up with this Arctic fox and we were like, oh, not native, but okay. Um, our original thought was we were going to give her or try to give her to the Smithsonian, which is in DC to see if they wanted um, her for part of their collection. But our, our at the time rehab manager fell in love with her and was like, she'd make a great, you know, case about why the exotic wildlife trade is so detrimental and all these things and why foxes don't make good pets. Um, so we did keep her and she now has our, our largest enclosure in our ambassador walk area. Wow. So can, is this, so okay. Ambassador animals in, in my very limited experience, like you can sometimes bring them to like a classroom to like show, mm -hmm. uh, can you bring that Fox like on a leash to a. Yeah. So she awesome. is harness and leash trained, which in my, and in my opinion, she's actually better leash trained than most dogs I've met, which is crazy. That's great. Um, but she's very much not like a pet. So she doesn't want to be cuddled. She doesn't want to be touched. Um, she very much has her person, which is our previous staff manager who she still comes and volunteers multiple days a week to take her for like an hour long walk every day. Um, that is her person. So technically I can go in and I can work with her and I could take her out and, you know, walk her and we do well, but she, she by no means has the same reaction to me as she does to our other, our, uh, our previous staff manager. So nice. Um, so there have been a couple of questions like, uh, along the lines of, are there any animals that you've worked with that you've just like completely fallen in love with that you've had uh, a hard time releasing back into the wild? Um, I don't think there's ever really been to a point, there's never a point where I'm like, I don't want to release you because I love you so much. It's mm -hmm. more like, I love you so much that I want to make sure you have all of the, the skills and tools and behaviors that you need to not only survive in the wild, but to thrive in the wild. Right. Um, I get very attached to some of our like baby songbirds where, especially in the beginning of the season, before we get um, interns and stuff for the summer, we start seeing baby birds in April. So mm -hmm. I'll be in there helping to hand feed baby birds. And I'm like 
what can we do to like give them the best success? So yeah. there's never really been a time that I can think of that I'm like, oh no, like I, I wish we could keep you because in my, in my mind, I'm, you know, giving them the life they actually deserve. So I, I love seeing them go free. There are a few times where I do get like very particular where I'm like, oh, it's going to rain for three days. We cannot release them in the middle of this. We have to wait for uh-huh. perfect weather for four or five days when it's not too hot and it's not too cool and like find the perfect release site. So I know they're going to be safe, but that's, that's kind of as far as that goes in terms of holding them back or anything along those lines. Right. That's, I, I feel very similarly um, about my little foster kittens. Like they're so cute, but get them out of the house and get them into their own home. Yeah. So that I don't end up with too many cats in this house. Grow up, get a Grow job. Up, get out of here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we have a bunch of questions that are asking, do you ever uh, rehabilitate uh, aquatic animals? Do you ever rehabilitate a fish or something else that lives underwater? We have never gotten a fish before. We have gotten, like, people have brought us butterflies with injured wings. Um, we've gotten a bumblebee before that if they get, like, cold shocked or get oh. stuck inside somewhere, we've had people bring those to us, um, which are always really adorable. Um, I think, like, we get a aquatic turtles, which, I mean, all turtles, for the most part, that we get here, we're way, way far away from the coast, so we don't get sea turtles but we get you know snapping turtles aquatic turtles stuff like that um we do have tubs that we have and we use for them that are deep and give them enough water to get in and out um we don't ever really take anything that's fully aquatic in that sense cool um a bunch of people want to know who funds this work who pays for this um that's a great question uh so we are not state or federally funded because we are a nonprofit, and it's actually written into our permits that we are not allowed to charge as rehabilitators we cannot charge for our work so even if we wanted to try and like offset that is like legally we can't be like oh yeah thanks for this cat attack bird uh that's going to be two hundred dollars for treatment we can't do that However, um, a lot of people, you know, realize how much of a a community need we are, you know, they don't want to just leave an animal to suffer. um, And that's what we're here for to help them. Um, So a lot of people do appreciate what we do. They'll give donations when they drop animals off. We also have um, uh, merchandise that we sell in the front of our facility as well. It's on, it's on our website. If anybody ever wants some Blue Ridge Wildlife merch, Um, we've got these really lovely mugs hello um (laughs) but and we always have new stuff that we like we just got even cooler mugs which I'm gonna have to buy like three of them for Christmas um but we do sell merchandise which is like a a small portion of our profits and we also do education programs which we do charge for um depending on you know who's asking for them Um, we do have some kind of financial assistance as well for maybe uh schools that can't afford our fee, we can kind of adjust from there. Um, But most of our income is really just from kind, generous people who make donations to our facility. Um, We also do a lot of fundraising, either on Facebook. Um, We used to have two annual fundraisers in person, but obviously the pandemic has kind of washed that out. Um, but we, we do a lot of fundraising to try and offset that, you know, the prices and, and the, the things that we do have to purchase, like medications and surgical equipment. And, you know, we have an x-ray and a surgical suite on site. So we have to provide for that, but we're not charging for our services. For sure. Very cool. Um, what is the slimiest animal you have ever worked with? The slimiest? Um, that I've ever worked with? Uh, I mean, I don't know that I've ever really worked with something that I would would categorize as slimy. We get like donated fish and that's the worst. (laughs) Um, Salamanders? I mean, salamanders, they're like, like they're kind of wet, but like I wouldn't, I don't know, I wouldn't consider them slimy. And we generally are using gloves whenever we handle right. them too, so that we're not giving them anything that they'll absorb through their skin. Um, right. so I don't get a ton of, I don't get slimy vibes from them. Um, 
I can't like, and snakes are smooth. They're nice. Sure. Um, not me at all. So like sometimes we get like really old, like prehistoric snapping turtles that are just like covered in a layer of algae. That's slimy. That is, that's probably slime the central. Slime sure. factor. Yeah. Slime factor <laughs> off the charts. That's great. Um, a lot, okay, a lot of questions about size. So what is the smallest animal that you've rehabilitated and the biggest animal that you've rehabilitated? Um, largest would probably be, I'm trying to think back. To, I mean, probably when I worked in California, technically we would get in elephant seals and California oh sea God. lions. Um, I was never there when we got adult elephant seals, but I was there for a couple of adult California sea lions and those are like, they're yeah. massive. Yeah. What, so that, how, how do that you not really get fun. hurt working with them? Um, honestly, so the facility that I worked at or I interned at really in California, they have these enclosures, the Marine Mammal Care Center in San Pedro. If you guys are, are local there, go visit them because you can actually watch them feed and clean and stuff like that. They're awesome. Um, they, so you have like these big boards, these big wooden boards, and it's just kind of like a wall between you and them. And if you have to go in, you just have, it's yourself. And normally you have another person with you to kind of walk your back and you just walk in. And for the most part, as long as they have somewhere to move away from you, they don't really want to be near you. So they're not going to lash out and come after you unless you're cornering them and you have to like jump them or something like that. But for the most part, the adults we never really had to do that for them. It was mostly just the, the younger pups. Um, as far as smallest patient, we had like a two gram spring peeper that we did surgery on. That was hilarious, wow. very, very cute. Yeah, he had a broken leg. Um, so we had to do surgery to stabilize the leg and he ended up making a full recovery and we got to release it and literally like, peepers I don't know if you guys are familiar but they're like just barely big like maybe that big sitting on like the tip of your finger very cute so okay is a peeper they're probably a frog our or a bird yeah it is a sorry it's a frog, frog. <laughs> is it a frog or a bird yes uh, uh frog. very good okay cool um next question what is the most stubborn or aggressive animal that you've had to work with oh um stubborn Osprey, which is a bird also. Um, Osprey, amazing in the wild, beautiful. They're great at what they do, which their only job is to catch fish, amazing. But in rehab, you put a fish at their feet and they kind of look at it and they're just like, what do I do with my hands? And we're like, no, you do you remember this, this, your job? Do you remember that? And they're like, I have no, I have no understanding. And we're like, oh my gosh. So most of the time when we get Osprey in, we have to force feed them oh. until they're basically released. We have had some good luck if we get fish that are like just the right size for them. You can't use minnows and you can't use like big catfish or gar or anything like that. You have to get like the perfect like six to nine inch fish. And they're like, oh yes. I get that. That's fine. But other than that, they're just, they're very derpy. The derpy birds. I love them, but they're like, stay out of rehab the because yeah. Um, was the other word stubborn or aggressive? Was that the other question? Yeah. Aggressive. I mean, honestly, I don't think so, but our vet always makes comments that garter snakes are super aggressive. She like will not handle garter snakes without like thick leather gloves because she's terrified of them. And I'm like, whatever floats your boat. That's fine. I have you know, grabbed you garter snakes before and I haven't been bitten yet, but I don't suggest Maybe it's Virginia garter snakes. Maybe, Maybe it's only the ones that come into rehab. They're already upset and oh, they're yeah. like, this is the worst service I've ever gotten. Like <laughs> ridiculous. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I, I've never, you know, dealt with, Maybe mother raccoons, they're very much will ruin your entire life if you threaten their babies. And like that, those are like, we'll just give you another cage to walk into. That's fine. Whatever you want, whenever you want to do that. So yeah. <laughs> cool. 
Um, <laughs> Oh, I just had a question. There are, so just, just for everybody at home, just so you know, if your question hasn't been answered yet, that's because uh, we've answered 54 questions so far uh, and there are 383 questions still left to be unanswered. So I'm not trying to uh, ignore your questions. It's just, there are so many of them. Um, we're so glad you're all here. Typically um, we get to more questions than this, but there are a lot of you here today, which is great. Um, the next question is, what's like a range of weird animals that you get in that you're like this doesn't live here like what is this doing here i imagine the arctic fox was an example of that what else do you get yeah yeah the arctic fox is an example of that um we really don't get a ton of those because if it's if it's truly exotic and it's okay to be a pet like a ball python or something like that then generally it, it wouldn't come to us us, it would go to a shelter. Um, I'm trying to think if we got like anything really weird. Um, not a whole lot. And especially if they're if they're like vagrant, like migratory birds that also shouldn't be here. Most of the time, we wouldn't see them anyway. Um, I know another rehab has gotten a snowy owl uh, about a year ago in the winter time, which this is is kind of far down for them, depending on what kind of year they're having. If it's an eruption year, they all come down. Um, but we don't normally see snowy owls and that's, that's really kind of it. Like we did get a porcupine who had already passed away by the time he got to us, which technically DWR does not consider porcupines in Virginia. Um, but we know that they're in West Virginia and we are like right in the corner of Virginia into West Virginia. So we know that they're, they're coming into Virginia. There have been studies showing that there are camera trail mm -hmm. sightings, um, camera trap sightings of porcupines in Virginia and different counties. So we know they're, they're coming back, but that it's not really a, an established population that right. the state is acknowledging, but that's probably as, as much as, you know, weird stuff that we really get other than the Arctic Fox. Very cool. Um, okay. A lot of people have asked this, have you ever been bitten in your line of work? Oh yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I have, I actually, this has been a really rough year for me in terms of workers comp. Um, so I got bitten by a raccoon through a, a leather welding glove. Oh my God. Um, and it, it wasn't sure if it was really a true bite because it felt like he pinched my finger and then I pulled my hand out of the glove and my finger was bleeding. So we were like, it was it a bite do I need and I just ended up we called the health department I ended up getting my booster anyway um and then in the fall this past fall I went on an eagle rescue and I ended up getting taloned right in the arm which was totally my fault um that was completely on me I did not have I took leather gloves but I did not take eagle gauntlets which come all the way up above your elbow. Um, from what the caller described, it sounded like an eagle that was very down and would have been relatively easy to grab. And I was in a rush and I was like, I don't want to look for the eagle gauntlets. I'll just take these gloves and this crate. Let's go. And yeah, and then that happened. So that was not fun. 10 out of 10 do not recommend. Um, mm -hmm. So PPE is always important. Um, and <laughs> always just be as safe as possible when handling wildlife. Wear gloves. Um, but that's really it. I've, I've been bitten by a raccoon, uh, but everything else, I, I, we really try to make sure like restraint doesn't allow them to bite us. Our PPE doesn't allow them to bite us. I've been bitten like with a glove, but not through the glove. And right. you're just like, that's rude, but right. it's fine. You it. can't blame them. They're having a <laughs> terrible day. Just awful. Exactly. Uh, nice. Um, do you ever get alligators? Someone has asked that question about four times. So alligators? Um, yeah. No, we do not. We do not have alligators in Virginia. Someone asked me the other day. They were like, "What would you do if you saw an alligator while we were like out walking?" And I was like, "I would take a picture because that would be an amazing sighting in Virginia." So right. um, yeah, we don't we don't get alligators up here. But if we did, I'm on, I would be on it. I would love to hang out with alligators. Alligators are the coolest. Their babies right. are so cute. I could die. They're just so cute. Ugh. Oh my goodness. Um, do you have any pets? 
I do. I have two cats, two indoor cats. Nice. And indoor cats, why do you keep your cats indoors? I keep my cats indoors um, because number one, 15% of our almost 3,000 patients are brought in because of confirmed cat attacks. So that's 15% of our animals that could have not needed us. That And only about a quarter of those animals that come in for cat attacks live. Oh. Even though we, you know, treat them, we do surgery on them, we get the medications right away. Um, there's just so much damage that cats, when they bite something, they puncture a lot of organs and stuff like that. Um, they have this really nasty bacteria in their mouths and their claws that are designed basically to help kill the animals that they grab. Um, so even if we get them relatively quickly, sometimes it's too late, depending on the size. Um, it's also dangerous for the cats to put them outside. I lost, I left our door, our front door open one time accidentally right before a blizzard and our cat got out for six hours and I was like a massive wreck because all I could think about was she's short haired. She's not going to survive this blizzard that's happening. She's never been outside before. So she doesn't have the skills to survive. Um, we live in a busy neighborhood, so she could be hit by a car. We live in a neighborhood that has lots of trees and wildlife, so she could be taken by an owl or eaten by a coyote. Um, so there were, and like diseases and ticks and fleas that can cause all kinds of issues for her. I was like an emotional wreck until we found her again. Um, so we are, our cats are, are strictly indoors. We do have harnesses and leashes that we take them out on when it's nice out and they want to go. Um, but otherwise they have like more fun toys than I do. So <laughs> they are very enriched and, and, you know, have a lot of fun at home. Yeah. Keep your cats inside. Better for the cats, better for everybody outside. Um, yes, I, I also sure. have, uh, I started with two indoor cats. Now I have three. I know it's too many cats, but I got a, I got this really, really old foster cat and she didn't have any teeth and nobody wanted her. So now she's my cat. Those are, those are the best. I mean, they're, the limit doesn't yeah. exist, Sarah. So like you could just keep. I know. No, it's, going. it's, we're at, it's three <laughs> is the max anymore it's already too many cats so anymore <laughs> cats, be completely out of control um okay so it is 142 these sessions we try to keep them uh capped at 45 minutes and we are getting there and so we like to ask everybody the same two questions at the end of every session so the first question is if you had the attention of everyone in the entire world uh, and assume they can all understand what you're saying language wise um and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise, what would you tell them? I would tell them that, oh, this is hard. If you find an injured or ill animal, get them to someone who is a professional in handling that animal right away. Don't wait a week. Don't wait until after you've been feeding it for two days and now it looks bad. Call someone immediately because that is going to save that animal's life, not you asking the Google machine what kind of cereal and milk this baby bird should be eating. So that, I'd, I'd have to go with that. Great, great advice. Next question <laughs> um, will either be easier or harder, uh, but it's nearly the same question. Um, so you still have everybody's attention in the world, but you can tell them one thing about literally anything. It can be as big picture important or silly and insignificant, like, like, almond oh. are better than mounds like whatever you want to say what do you what do you tell everybody oh you know I have oh, Sarah. I want to say something about possums but I don't know if that's appropriate for all of our audience possums um as long as it's well I don't know what you're gonna say but but possums in general are lovely um, they are lovely if I could oh, tell anyone anything don't say anything don't say anything um about uh, their reproductive <laughs> material, I guess. Okay. All right. All right. That's so what if I you're old enough, ask. look up something um, about possum reproductive material. If you're not, please dis disregard that. There's an 88 amazing page PDF on possums, which just goes into all the awesome history about them. I recommend finding that. Um, if I could tell them anything, uh, oh gosh, normally the possum one is my one. Uh, Possums can get rabies. They can. They can. Yes. It's very, it's unlikely, 
but they can do it. And any mammal can get rabies. So don't handle them with your bare hands or let them lick your fingers or kiss them on the mouth. Those are all big no-nos for the mammals. Don't kiss mammals. That's a, that's a, <laughs> except for humans, I guess. That's Unless they're consenting human mammals and it's, you know, yes. But that sounds good. Excellent mm -hmm. advice. Don't kiss the random mammal you encounter on the street. Love it. Uh, well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to us. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, no, just if you guys are curious, look up your wild, your state wildlife agency, see if there are any rehabbers in your area, save their phone numbers now, visit their social media, you know, visit their websites and just make yourself familiar with this really awesome resource that you hopefully have in your community and just be prepared. That's pretty much it. Wonderful. Thank you again. Um, and thank you so much, Ashley, for signing for us. Um, we will be back here. Uh, the next time is going to be about neuroscience. That's going to be on September 23rd. The 23rd is Thursday at 1 p.m. If you want to keep up to date on everything going on, um, I just posted the link to our uh, live stream website so you can see what we have coming up. Um, you will need to RSVP to get the link just like you did today. Um, that's really it. If you can support our program, we really rely on small donations. The average donation to our program is about 11 bucks. It's like 1150 or something is the average donation. So we're not like relying on a couple wealthy people. We're relying on a lot of regular people. So if you can help us, we really appreciate it. You can do that at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or donate directly. And that is linked on Skype a scientist.com. Thank you so much for coming and we will see you all next week. Bye. Bye.